Great. Okay. Um, let's go ahead and ask the other person. Uh, this morning, we are starting on the parable. Um, having, we're taking a temporary break from Romans uh, because we spent the first, um, I guess, about 20 weeks going through the first eight chapters of Romans, explaining the very fundamental principles of salvation. That's what Romans is about. And as we went through it, I think you, could, you understood why a young German monk radically changed the course of Western European civilization when he read the book of Romans. And he said if he had to be stranded on a deserted island, remember now this is in the age, Martin Luther lived in the age of discovery when the new world was being discovered. So the concept of being stranded on a deserted island was not foreign. He said, if I had to be stranded on a deserted island, and I had to take only one book of the Bible with me, it would be the book of Romans. And that's why we spent the, those 20 weeks. Now we'll come back to Romans, but I thought, it's such a heavy and long book that I thought a little break would help. We're gonna look at the parables of Jesus. Uh, first of all, uh, thanks to uh, Mrs. Glasgow, my mother, <laughs> Uh, she made sure I got a, a, a classical education, Greek and Latin, and the <laughs> word parable, the English word parable, comes from a combination of two Greek words, para, which means alongside, as in the Holy Spirit is the paracletus, coming alongside you when you're not saved, when you're not saved and is telling you that you need to come to the Lord, that you are a sinner that you're not as good as your friends are telling you. Mm. Uh, so para and balo, uh, which means to cast. Mm. So this means to cast alongside. And what the word, and, it, and they combine these two words to form the word parabole, which means to cast, literally to cast alongside. In other words, it's a parallel story to the one you're telling. You're telling this story, but there's really a parallel truth uh, along with that. And it's interesting, I want you to know something. During the time of uh, the, the Grecian Empire, so many, uh, and the, the Jews of course were scattered, so many of them spoke Greek that the uh, Jewish leaders authorized a Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures well, as you've heard me say before, the, I, I tend to call the Old Testament the Hebrew Testament. They authorized the Septuagint. Septuagint meant there were 70 Hebrew Greek scholars who looked and translated it, and that became the official Greek translation of the Hebrew Testament. And the word, I want you to notice, they use this word parabole to describe Solomon's Book of Proverbs. The word mashal in Hebrew is the same word that the, Greek, that the Hebrew scholars, translating it into Greek, use the word parabole. So to them, a proverb and a parable were one and the same. In the English language, we have tended to separate the two. Remember I said to you, a parable is a story. Of, it's an earthly story with a heavenly meaning, a spiritual meaning. Let me say that again. A parable is an earthly story. It's a story about things happening here on earth with a heavenly meaning. On the other hand, um, my, um, at my age, of course, I'm trying to impress the young Arab so that I can read about my classes. <laughs> um, yeah, <laughs> you know, I don't think she's fooled. <laughs> um, a proverb is a phrase or a sentence. It's not a story. So if I say to you, um, a rolling stone gathers no moss. It's a sentence, it's not a story. If I say, too many crooks spoil the suit, you get the, what I'm trying to say, but it's not a story. A parable is a story, 
meaning there's more than one sentence and there is a little bit of a beginning, a climax, and an end to it. So keep that in mind. And one of the things that uh, I'm going to go into to, to help you understand parables, because people sometimes have misinterpreted the parables to think that Jesus is saying something totally different than what he's saying. Uh, this is a, a parable consists of two, uh, two parts. One part is called the elements, that is the persons or objects that are in the parable, and the interpretation of symbols in the parable. Now, I will go into this some more when we come to the parable of the uh, mustard tree, because that is probably the best way to explain these two elements. But when it comes to interpretation, understand there's a basic uh, hermeneutics principle that is, uh, that is taught. It's called the principle of first mention. And what that means is, if you want to know what a word means, or what a certain symbol, like I say, an eagle means, or a, a, a bird means, you go back in the Bible to the place where it is first mentioned, and that will give you the correct interpretation. One of the things that when we come to the parable of the, of the mustard seed, is that people assume that when this gigantic tree grew and all the birds flew in it, that was a wonderful thing, all these people coming to the Lord. The birds, when the first bird mentioned is the dove, and it specifically is a reference to the Holy Spirit. But when birds in general are first mentioned, it's in the law, and they are dirty. Remember God said to them, when he talked about you can only eat clean birds and dirty birds. He mentioned only dirty birds. There's no mention of what a clean bird is. It's all dirty birds. You can't eat any carrion on like eagles or hawks or uh, owls or things like that. And so in the first mention, birds are seen as dirty, as, um, as servants of the evil one, uh, of Satan. So that's why when people says, oh, all these wonder, all these people came into and all these birds came and settled in the tree. That must be good. No. Go back to the principle of first mention. Very, very important. But we'll come to that in great, I'll explain in great detail when we come to the, the parable of the mustard seed. And lastly, I want you to know most people think the parables exist only, only in the Christian testament. The New Testament? And the answer is no. I'm going to point out to you two prominent examples in the Hebrew Testament of a parable, but we are going to spend all of our time talking about the parables of our Lord and Master. Let's go to, if you don't have to turn there because I'm going to read it for you, but this is, if you need the reference, it's in your book, it's 2 Samuel chapter 12, the first four verses. Then the Lord sent Nathan to David. This is, by the way, when Nathan confronts David about his sin with Bathsheba. This is what this is in reference to. Then the Lord sent Nathan to David. When he came to him, he said, being Nathan, there were two men in a certain town. Keep that in mind. One rich and the other poor. The rich man had a large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb. Notice the feminine. He had bought. He raised it, grew it up with him and his children. It shared his food, drank from his cup, and even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. That is a parable, and it's from the Hebrew Testament. Here's what it means. There were two men in the town, in a certain town. The town. Jerusalem. God is interested in one city, Jerusalem. Uh, it's not Washington, D.C. That's what you were hoping. <laughs> it is not. Uh, 
And it's not Moscow, and it's not Beijing. Okay? God is interested in one country, Israel. There are more prophecies concerning the, the come on in Salvador, concerning the nation of Israel than there, are, than there is about the coming Messiah in the Hebrew Testament. There's a lot of prophecies. This will happen to Israel. If you, do, if you do this, this will happen. If you don't do this, this will happen. So that tells you that, you know, when people start looking and saying to me, well, I don't see anything about the Ukraine war in the Bible. It's not there because God is not interested in the wars between Gentiles. The, when God discusses a war that includes a Gentile nation, it also includes Israel. So it's typically that nation coming against Israel, like Babylon, like Egypt, um, like the Greeks, like uh, Alexander the Great. So <clears throat> understand <clears throat> that the Bible doesn't tell you about the war between Chile and Bolivia that occurred in the 80s. No, it doesn't matter. Those things are not important. It's not that God doesn't care about those people. God cares about everybody. It's not important to the prophetic timeline that has to do either with the Messiah or the setting up of the kingdom. Keep that in mind. Mm -hmm. So let's go back to this parable and see what the parts are. The certain town is Jerusalem. The rich man, these are the elements I'm discussing, by the way. The town is an element, and, it, and the interpretation is Jerusalem. The rich man is David. Element is rich man, and interpretation is David. The poor man is Uriah. It, the element is poor man, and the meaning and interpretation is Uriah. Okay? The large number of sheep and cattle refers to the fact that David had a large number of concubines and wives. Understand, I know this is where you know, I, I explain it best to people. A concubine was a mistress who lived in the same house with your wife. Now, of course, today, if you did that, your wife would say, I'm reloading. Just keep talking, <laughs> I'm reloading. You know, where is that AR-15? Uh, no, <laughs> no, but you have to understand, in, a, in that era, uh, God did not, uh, God did not uh, bless this, or, um, you know, he did not say having multiple wives was a great thing. In fact, he warned against the king and the priest taking multiple wives. He warned against it. And that's because I have no idea why anyone would want to have multiple wives. I can barely handle the one I've got. You know? Amen. <laughs> <laughs> say hi to the <laughs> uh, You know, but, uh, you know, David had a lot of wives. And concubines, both. Uh, but Uriah didn't have multiple wives and a concubine. He had two. <coughs> and David took Uriah's wife. Now, you say, who is the traveler? The traveler in this parable that Nathan is relating to David about the traveler, the traveler is Satan coming to David in the form of sexual lust. Sometimes Satan shows up as a snake. Sometimes he shows up as lust. Sometimes he shows up as greed. In this case, he's showing up as a traveler in the form of sexual lust. He can even show up as an angel of light. Oh, yes. Which is probably... Explains a lot of the cults. Most of the... Yeah. Yes. Uh, it explains a lot of the yeah, cults. That's right. Mm -hmm. uh, naturally, uh, Islam is not a cult. It's a totally separate religion. Uh, if you look at it, uh, how we define religion. Who came to uh, Muhammad? He said, the Gabriel angel, uh, the, the angel of Gabriel came to him in the light. Another story. As I told you before, as a physician, I have looked, I've read the hadith cover to cover, and I can tell you from reading the hadith, Muhammad most likely had 
a grade two astrocytoma of the brain, and it, it, it caused seizures, of course it would, and that explains why he had these visions. What he was having is, after a seizure, and I not only know this because I'm a doctor, I know this because I have a son who has seizure, a seizure disorder. The, uh, you go into what's called a post ictal state, and you see and hear things, and that was for, for his vision. Mm. Uh, but there's no question, if you look at the way he lived, the multiple seizures he had, and the way he died, there's no question in my mind, speaking as a physician, and I know Muslim physicians who agree with this diagnosis, he most likely had a low grade, probably a grade one or grade two, astrocytoma of the brain. He clearly couldn't have had a grade four because he would have been dead in six months. So it had to be low grade. And it explains a lot of the symptoms he had. Now, um, getting back to this parable, again, so you see, we have we pretty much explained everything. And of course, the ewe lamb was Bathsheba. Yes, Ron? Did you, did you state the parable? Yes, I did. Let me tell you. This is Nathan coming to David, and he's telling David a story about a, a rich man and a poor man in a certain town, and the, the rich man took one of the lamb, took the, the only ewe lamb that the poor man had, and fed it to the trout. That's the parable. And, so, and then again, I said, a parable is a story, and that's the story here. Now, and you got the elements. I went through all of those with you. Uh, you say, why would... He describes Satan as a traveler. In the book of Job, God describes Satan as roaming to and fro, cruising up and down Sunset Boulevard, just looking for some play. Isn't that what he does? He's looking for opportunity. He's looking for an opportunity to put a temptation in front of you. And that's exactly why I describe the interpretation of the word traveler is from the book of Job. Um, now, let me give you the, um, the, the, the second parable that you can find in the Hebrew Testament. And uh, this one is from 2 Kings chapter 14, verse 9. <coughs> this is just to show you that parables are not unique. <coughs> To the Christian Testament. I want you to get that. Uh, I, want you to, I want you to see that. This is 2 Kings chapter 14, verse 9. Joash was the king of Israel, and he sent a message in the form of a parable to Amaziah, who was the king of Judah, the southern kingdom. So jo uh, Joash is in the north. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, Jehoash is in the north, and Amaziah is in, is in the south. I know a lot of these things are so similar, it's easy to get them mixed up. Um, to get the context of this story, you have to understand that Amaziah had just defeated the, the uh, Edomites. And he felt that, okay, God gave me victory over the Edomites, who were uh, relative to the other, uh, to the northern kingdom, small. But the northern kingdom of Israel were 10 tribes, and Judah, the southern, was only two tribes. So he thought, I'll take on Israel, and I'll reunite the two, um, the two kingdoms back into one kingdom, like it was in the day of Solomon. God made it abundantly clear that he caused the separation of the kingdom into two tribes because of their disobedience. And Therefore, God didn't ask Amaziah to put the two kingdoms back together. He never did. It's not recorded anywhere that he asked Amaziah to do that. Amaziah is doing this in his own strength. Uh, and surprisingly, what happened? He challenged Jehoash to a battle. He says, come down. You know, it's like you say to the kid, you know, meet me outside in the schoolyard. And, you know, we'll have a discussion. Uh, and Jehoash is actually behaving quite responsibly here. Typically, every single king in the north was ungodly. Most of the kings in the south were, you know, and a few were good, and some were downright bad. Okay, um, so 
Jehu is, uh, is actually acting more godly, if you ask me in this case, than is Amaziah. Because he writes to Amaziah and he says, he says, you know, why don't you take a cold drink? Have some lemonade with ice cubes. You know, here's what he says. This is the story, this is his response to Amaziah saying, come and meet me in the school year. He says, a thistle in Lebanon sent a message to a cedar in Lebanon. Give your daughter to my son in marriage. Then a wild beast in Lebanon came along and trampled the thistle underfoot. What? That's a very short story. It has a lot of meaning. What are the elements? A thistle. What is a thistle? It's a weed. You, you walk over it and you don't even realize you walked over it. It's like unimportant. The second F is a cedar in Lebanon. Now, why did he pick Lebanon? Because Lebanon was north. And he's trying to tell, he's trying to say to him, I'm referencing the north. So the, the, the king of the north is telling the king of the south, the north is a dangerous place. You're a thistle. You would be a thistle. If you come north, you would be a thistle. And he's saying a thistle in the north is saying to a cedar. Now, we, living in California, we have a pretty good idea of how big cedars can be. They're massive. And they're tall. It is estimated that the, um, and they last a long time, that the, the, um, the redwoods in California probably started growing when Solomon was the king of Israel. That gives you an idea of how old they are. So he's saying this massive ancient tree is being challenged by a thistle, a weed. And then he says, a wild beast comes and tramples the thistle underfoot. Of course, the wild beast cannot trample the cedar underfoot because it's too big. Why did he pick a wild beast? He's probably referring to his army. Jehoash is referring to Jehoash's army as a bunch of wild beasts, wild animals, lions, bears, leopards. Because at that time, there, there were still lions in, 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 in that country <coughs> in the Middle East. Today, of course, they have all been eliminated by civilizations and other things. But this is what he's saying. In other words, he's telling him, chill out, guy, chill out. You're asking for a fight that you don't need. Another parable from the Hebrew text. So uh, with that in mind, so that you, you have a, a, an overall picture of the origin of the word, the components of the word, and the fact that it's not just a Christian issue, it's a Hebrew issue as well. Now, let's start with the, uh, one of the first parables that I, I mentioned to you. And this is um, uh, the, uh, in Matthew 5, verse 14, uh, 14 to 16. This is Jesus speaking, of course. He says, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it gives light unto all that are in the house. Now, the key point in this is in the next, in the next sentence. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. I want you to notice something. Jesus performed a lot of miracles and a lot of good works. Did you notice something was missing? Jesus never took a selfie after he did a miracle. Did you notice that? The greatest invention of our modern generation is the pogo stick that you can use to take a selfie. <laughs> Why? Because we think that we are the center of the universe. You and I know we're not the center of the universe. Jesus is, and should be, and is the center of our universe. Because we are individuals. We did not create this world. We 
cannot fix anything. I'm always amused by the people who can tell me to one-tenth of a degree the temperature a hundred years from now, but they can't predict the weather two weeks from now. Mm -hmm. Well, to a 70% accuracy. Mm -hmm. Probably. Yeah. Uh, no, 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 no. You are not God. You know, as when I first came to Christ, I heard a lady, I was listening to a lady on the radio, and she said, there are two certainties in this world. There is a God. That stuck with me. That stuck with me a great deal. Um, so, understand what he's saying. We are the mirrors that reflect his light. Jesus is the light. We are reflecting his light when we study his word and we share it. That's what I want you to do. When, as I said, when you leave here, you, even if all you ever say to the lady at the grocery store is, God bless you, you're getting her a thing. I want you to remember that our job is to know God and to make him known. I like that expression. It's from um, Greg Laurie. To know God. So, the second parable that we're looking, going to look at is uh, the parable of the wise and foolish builders. Therefore, now I'm not going to go into explaining elements because in some, many of these the elements are very obvious, what the elements are. That's why I'm not going to go into that. Uh, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him unto a wise man who built his house upon a rock. When the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, it did not fall. For it was founded upon a rock. And everyone that hears these sayings of mine, and doesn't do it, shall be likened unto a foolish man, which built his house upon the sand, and the rain descended, and the floods came, the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell. And great was the fall of it. I mean, it's, it's pretty clear the meaning of this parable. Two men building a house in the same geographic location with the same material. The one house stood and the other house collapsed. Why? Because who is our God? Jesus is our God. Not Joseph Smith, not Muhammad, not Buddha, not Krishna. Not Charles Stays Russell. They are not rocks. They are men with feet with feet of clay. They are men. When you look at when you look at our modern day Christians, one of the things I notice is they tend to assume that. If I hear the word, I must be doing the word. No. Hearing is one thing. And as I told you, you hear and understand with the netesh in, in Hebrew, the mind, the soul, the intellect. That's what the word netesh means in Hebrew. And we, we tend to use the word soul. It has to move. Jesus said, you must love the Lord thy God with all of your mind. Sorry. And soul. In other words, the understanding has to move from here to here. That was my problem for decades. It was up here, but never made it down here. Until, you know, God has a sense of With all my education that my mother gave me, uh, and, and in reality, it's my father. When he died, he made sure my mother was well taken care of. I have to uh, thank my father for that because he left her a lot when he died. But with all that education, God has a sense of humor. He sent an uneducated truck driver to me and 
We explained it now. Does God have a sense of humor? Yes, he does. No one ever explained it to me as clearly as that man did. And he explained it to me, and he walked out of my life. I never saw him again. He had no idea the profound impact he had upon me. And the next week, this gentleman here walked into my life. And he was important because I, a lot of my clients are Mormon Catholics, Mormon law Catholics. And they often wonder, how come you're not a Mormon? You're such a nice person. <laughs> now, you see what would have happened to me if I didn't have somebody like Dave in my life? I would have been easily led astray. After all, they were my clients. I made a lot of money out of them. It's all about Jesus. It's not about behaving, it's about believing. Yes. You understand with your mind and you believe in your heart. It's not about trying or doing, it's about what Jesus did, past tense. Mm -hmm. 